happy little games. UFOs, creatures from other planets, little green men from Mars, and yes, even E.T. Everybody thought they were so cute, at least until the movie Aliens came along. With their gyrating, body swaying, face hugging action, all of a sudden people were terrified of the unknown entities from outer space. Sega took notice and gave us another classic arcade game by the name of Alien Syndrome. It combined run and gun action, hostage negotiation, as well as the ability to blast those alien scum to smithereens. What was the inspiration for this arcade game? Let's find out as we face hug the night away and learn about the history of Alien Syndrome. The year is 1986 and Sega is in the midst of one of the greatest runs of arcade hits in history. They either had or soon released games such as Wonder Boy, Afterburner, Space Harrier, and Power Drift. The developers at Sega set out to create an overhead run and gun game, but they wanted the player to feel confined and also be able to move room to room. They were inspired by the arcade hit Gauntlet, but utilizing only two players simultaneously instead of four. This was similar to how their 1990 arcade game Crackdown would turn out. The only problem was they didn't have a theme. Japanese companies at the time looked to Western cinema for inspiration. Sega had no problems lifting sound samples from An American Werewolf in London or Rambo, but an entire movie concept? Sure, why not? The movie Aliens was making a big splash across North America and Sega wanted to capitalize. The movie saw a group of individuals trapped in space who have to contend with lethal monsters and a strong female protagonist as their lead. So they decided to adopt this storyline and implement it into their latest arcade game. Alien Syndrome was released in 1987 by Sega. This is a simultaneous two-player run-and-gun game in which you have to rescue all of the hostages on each ship while taking down those stinky, disgusting aliens. You can choose either Mary or Ricky, who just happened to look like Ripley and Colonel Hicks from the movie it was inspired from. The game takes place across seven levels in which you have to rescue all of the hostages who have been cocooned by the nefarious aliens. In addition to all those slimy creatures rolling about, you have to contend with the time limit, which isn't much of an issue unless you tend to drag your feet. You start out with the basic gun, which is not very strong, but there are various power-ups littered throughout the map. The power-ups are labeled with F being a flamethrower, B for a bomb, which eliminates everything on the screen, L for laser, which is extremely powerful and can shoot through most anything. FB for fireball, which increases the ratio of the destruction of your gun. O for option, which is a tiny little shield which helps protect the player. There are also map icons you find on the various walls which will show you where the hostages are located. After you have successfully rescued all of the hostages, a door will open up and you can exit the level. At the end of each level is a boss fight and some of these boss designs are downright grotesque. When I first played this game, I was amazed at how disgusting they were, but there was a bit of foreshadowing because years later I would go on to marry something similar. You will encounter giant brains, exploding hearts, and a giant face which looks to have its skin ripped off. Take a look at them in order to see what I mean.
The level design shouldn't prove to be too much of a problem, but the difficulty gets pretty high when it comes to the boss fights. There is also no option of continuing either. It's still fun to play though, especially in two player. The game was another arcade success for Sega, but surprisingly it did not spawn any sequels. The game was released in 2003 as part of the Sega Ages line for the PS2 and used 3D polygon graphics instead of standard sprites. One major positive is the addition of twin stick shooting, meaning you can shoot in one direction with the left stick and shoot in another direction with the right stick, similar to Robotron 2084 or Smash TV. In my opinion, this is something that should have been included in the original game and it feels absolutely perfect here. The game starts out very similar to the original game with you selecting either Ricky or Mary. At the start of each level, you set a time bomb for three minutes in which you have to rescue the minimum number of hostages and then reach the exit, otherwise it's curtains for you. You still have the mini-map located throughout the levels, but this time around there are obstacles such as open pits and more aggressive enemies. There is a bit more strategy this time around as certain weapons will do much better against the various bosses. A welcome addition is a life bar which is going to help because Sega has thrown all the enemies at you they possibly could. A new feature are the shot combos which are successive hits upon the enemy without you taking any damage. This does affect your overall score. A lot of the same weapons are available including the flamethrower and the laser gun, but there are a few new ones to boot, including grenades and a spread shot. The graphics and animation are pretty well done considering this is a budget title, although everything is a bit dark. The sound effects are absolutely fantastic, especially the guns which will really rattle your speakers. The music is so-so, although a bit on the mild side. Overall, this feels like the original arcade game only with updated visuals and bosses. If you are a fan of the arcade game, be sure and check this one out. In 2007, Alien Syndrome was released for the Nintendo Wii and PlayStation Portable. At the time, it was all about motion control games and unfortunately, this one is no different. Rather than do a straight up remake of the original game, this one is set 100 years after the events of the original Alien Syndrome. You take on the role of Eileen, who is on the trail to investigate the disappearance of her boyfriend Tom. The game introduces RPG elements and looks to be a sort of a cross between Smash TV and Diablo. You start the game by selecting one of five classes which will be upgraded throughout the game. Assisting you along the way is a drone known as the Scarab, which will help you in fights and give you access to more weapons, armor, and power-ups. There are 80 different types of armor to upgrade as well. If the inventory you are carrying is too heavy, you can store some of it in the Scarab. So how well do the motion controls work in this game? Since I was always a big fan of the franchise, I bought this game on release day and couldn't wait to try it out. I put a good 4-5 to five hours into it and did not enjoy the controls whatsoever. Sometimes the motions work for taking care of the enemies and sometimes not, making for a very frustrating gaming experience. There is always a small lag in between your motion and the character's response on the screen. Now other people have said it was fine, so maybe it's just because I'm a dumb hick from the sticks. The right analog stick controls the camera while the Wiimote is your basic means of attack. There are power-ups just like the original and bosses among those. 
There are roughly 20 bosses in the game, with some of them being rehashes of the original, but they look fantastic. There were also over 100 different enemy types. Instead of simultaneous two-player action, this game supports four players on screen at the same time. The most fun I had with this game was when I had three other players and we were going medieval on the alien's butt. As a solo outing, not so much. The PSP version is very similar except it uses the thumbsticks to shoot. I actually enjoyed this version much better than the Wii version. The original arcade game was an unlockable on Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection. A 3D version was released for the Nintendo 3S on the compilation Sega 3D Archives 3. Stepping back in time to 1988, there were a number of conversions released and some of these turned out really well. Let's check out the Spectrum version first. Aside from a few quirks, this is a really well done version on the primitive hardware. Everything from the arcade game appears to be here including the glorious boss fights. The graphics and animation are well done and there is very little color clash which really helps the overall gaming experience. The speed of the game is consistent with the arcade game but there is one problem. At certain points when you fire a bullet, your player runs so fast that he can sometimes outrun the bullet. Don't know if he either dropped about 5 Red Bulls or just did a little bit of crack before he started playing, but it does seem just a little bit odd. Now it was my understanding that the early MS-DOS computers had an exclusive agreement on all farts and queefs in video games, but apparently that's just not the case. Bloops and bleeps and farts and queefs are what we get when it comes to the sound. To be honest, any sort of sound coming out of this machine is a welcome addition, so I guess I can't complain too much. They do their job and is better than sitting in silence, unless you're married. The controls work out pretty well and there is a simultaneous two-player option as well. The Amiga version is up next and at the time it was the best home conversion of this glorious arcade game. Although it's definitely not arcade perfect, the graphics do a great job of representing the original. The sprites are colorful and well defined and the animation is nice and smooth. The entire arcade presentation is included as well as simultaneous two player action. The gameplay is fast and furious but sometimes there is a problem with the scrolling. At times it seems to scroll fine, other times not so much. The sound effects and music are spot on with all of the voice samples from the arcade game included and are crystal clear. One of the problems that rears its ugly head is that there are only four levels instead of six. I don't know if the developers ran out of time, but it's a shame to see an otherwise good conversion drop a few notches because of this. Overall though, it's a really good conversion, especially back in 1989. Now let's take a look at the Amstrad version. Oh boy, where do I begin? Let's start with the positive, and yes, that was singular. There is pretty good music and sound effects while you play. Okay, now let's take a look at everything else. The gameplay is extremely slow and the animation looks like a bootleg cartoon from 1950s Russia. If you've ever played a video game and thought, wow, the scrolling is way too smooth for my blood, then this is the game for you. I've seen a lot of choppy scrolling in my life, but this one has to take the cake. 
Now I have to give the developers some credit for doing what they could do on this tiny little machine, but it just doesn't work. A lot of times your character and also the enemy bullets will blend into the background making it impossible to see. There are also only four levels with the mini bosses at the end of each one. The hitboxes on the characters are also way too big putting a perfect bow on the entire package. Just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, the MSX version rears its ugly head. This looks to be a port of the Spectrum version but running far worse and looking far uglier. The scrolling and animation appears to run at about 2 frames per second throwing the frantic gameplay out the window. Enemies will appear and you will have plenty of time to blow them to smithereens. The gameplay speed is laughable and I don't know how a game got released in this state. The sound effects are your basic bloops and bleeps with absolutely no music. This looks like it was coded by my 5 year old niece just after nap time at daycare. If the name of your game is pain then this is the game for you. The Atari SC version is very similar to the Amiga version. The same scrolling issues apply but overall it's still a good port. The ST version does have a reduced color palette and the quality of the music is not up to par either. All of the voice samples have been included but not quite as clear as the Amiga. The same frantic gameplay is still present making for an overall good conversion. The good old Commodore 64 version is up next and it's absolutely the best 8-bit port. While the sprites are not quite as detailed, the developers did manage to capture the Alien Syndrome feel. The scrolling is silky smooth along with the character animations. We even get some nice parallax scrolling on certain levels. The SID chip is put to good use with fantastic music and excellent sound effects. All of the content is here including the opening title animation in all six worlds and bosses. There is a bit of slowdown at times but overall it doesn't hurt the gameplay experience. As I mentioned, developers managed to replicate the arcade's feel so it literally feels like you are playing the arcade game. There is even a two player co-op mode available. This is a fantastic conversion and well worth a spot in your Commodore 64 library. The version most people are probably familiar with is the NES version. This was an unlicensed cartridge by Tengen but don't let that sway you, this is a really good version of Alien Syndrome. While it does attempt to replicate the arcade layout, it does add some cinemas in game which helps flesh out the story. The graphics and animation are nice although the color choices are a bit odd in my opinion. The scrolling is smooth although not quite as smooth as the Commodore 64 version. The gameplay speed also seems to be just a tad below the arcade original. The music and sound effects are adequate although they can't touch the Commodore 64 in terms of quality. Thankfully a simultaneous two player option has been included as well. There are also continues available to help you on your quest. This is another fine conversion which does a good job at replicating the arcade original.
Sticking with the 8-bit systems, the Master System is up next. The graphics are nicely detailed and the colors are a bit of a step up from the NES version. The animation is nice and smooth and the gameplay flows nicely, easily replicating the arcade game. Any fan of the original arcade game will notice right off the bat that the map layouts are totally different. Also, the game no longer scrolls but uses a flick screen scroll instead. This doesn't hurt the gameplay too much but it doesn't feel arcade authentic either. There is no music in the background but you do get decent sound effects while you play. Most of the levels have been included as well as the bosses although some of those have been changed as well. The game is also extremely difficult so put on your big boy pants when you play this version. It plays pretty good although I wish the arcade layout had been included. Surprisingly, the Game Gear version is not just a straight up port of the Master System version. This one gives you an animated opening explaining what's going on. We also have scrolling gameplay just like in the arcade original although the map layout is entirely different. While the viewpoint is zoomed in just a little bit making for a somewhat cramped feel, the sprites are nicely detailed and are animated perfectly. The gameplay offers some other differences including the map now being visible at any time as well as stackable weapons. You also have the ability to upgrade your weapons such as a flamethrower having a longer reach and fireballs having a homing option. The differences aren't just in the map layouts and the weapons, but there are a variety of new enemy types as well. The music and sound effects are really good and make good use of the Game Gear's audio chip. The controls feel nice and tight with fast gameplay. There is no simultaneous two-player option, but other than that, this is another really good conversion of the arcade game. The MS-DOS version is up next and for a 1989 conversion it's not too bad. The game looks very similar to the Amiga version although the colors seem to be not quite as sharp. The speed of the game is very consistent although the scrolling is a bit too choppy, although nowhere near as bad as some of the 8-bit versions. We do have sound blaster support so there is nary a fart or queef to be found. The sound effects and what little music we have sound pretty good and it even includes the digitized speech from the arcade game. The gameplay is good with nice responsive controls. All six levels are present as well as two player co-op. Another good conversion of this classic Sega arcade game. In 1992, the absolute best home conversion at the time was released for the X68000. This was programmed by Dempa and it shows because this is virtually arcade perfect. Everything from the graphics to the animation to the sound is fantastic. All six levels and bosses are included as well as a two player co-op. Of course, the playability is spot on and this is absolutely the best arcade version at home. And that brings us to the end of the history of Alien Syndrome. It's another fantastic classic arcade game from Sega, who was really on a roll during this time frame. It's always been one of my favorites and I'm glad I finally got to cover it. 
If you've never had a chance to blow away some face huggers, be sure and give this one a shot. You'll be glad you did. If you like this video, please be sure and like, share, subscribe, and comment down below. Also, if you would like to support me on Patreon, please click the link below. Thank you so much for watching.